solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as a trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. And picking up on a similar theme, uh, Sudhir, uh, you talk about uh, growing a category versus growing a brand. Yeah. And you frame it as a choice between uh, doing more versus doing better. Yeah. And uh, that's that's something I reflect on as well yeah. uh, in the context of journeys. There's always this choice between specialization and generalization. Yeah. And uh, maybe trying out adjacencies. Yeah. Give us a sense of how you think about this in the context of brands and maybe uh, yeah. reflect on it yeah. as you would apply it to just Yeah, no, I think Deepak, in the book, uh, uh, I think there are two separate points and I'll sort of answer them separately because uh, the first point is, why is it easier to grow a category than to grow market share within a category? And, and the second point is, why should a brand do what it's doing better rather than doing newer things? There are two, two separate... Uh, uh, related but separate questions. I think the first question is that a category growing represents an unsolved consumer problem. Gaining market share represents a problem that is already solved and you're trying to go and get a piece of the cake, right? So from a consumer point of view, you're, you're, you, it's always easier and better and sort of more profitable and in, in whichever way you look at it, solving an unsolved problem rather than someone solved the problem already and you're trying to solve 5% that problem 5% better. This is why it's generally easier and better to you know build categories and bake your own pie rather than take a piece of someone else's pie as a general rule of uh, principle. The second point is that within brands, it is always better for a brand to do what it does better rather than to do many things. And it goes back to the question on what brands are and the, what, what you know brands are fundamentally. Brands, if they're a set of associations, you've got three or four pieces of real estate in consumers' minds. And the consumers' minds is the most expensive place and difficult piece of real estate to get. Now, what your job is to deepen those associations and sort of really have them stronger. A new association, the cost of doing it is always much higher than the cost of deepening an association. So, and also when you get new associations in, you start weakening the older associations. Give us an example here. So, you know, I, I gave an example in a book. When I was a, a management trainee, I worked in the foods category. And... Uh, you know, for a brief while. And I saw that what sold in the market was basically Kisan tomato ketchup and Kisan mixed fruit jam. It was 80 to 90% of our business. 20 years later I came, or 18 years later I came as the director of the foods business. And when I looked at our foods business, it was still 90% of uh, tomato ketchup and mixed fruit jam. In that interim, we had launched many, many things as Kisan. We had launched Kisan soy juice, we had launched Kisan staples, we had launched Kisan health food drinks, etc., etc. But the fact is that in consumers' minds, Kisan was this fruits and vegetable brand, uh, and it wasn't anything else. And guess what? You know, less than 15% of Indians consume uh, Kisan. So the same amount of money had we spent deepening those associations and gone from 15 to 30, we'd have been a lot better off rather than trying to get new associations with Kisan. So there's always an unsolved problem in what you're doing well and to do more of it. Very rarely, like there might be a 10% chance that, you know, you're kind of hitting a wall, but nine or 10 times there's always more room uh, and it's always easier to win where you are rather than to sort of go wide. And, and, uh if you reflect uh, reflect on that in the context of uh, your journey or professional choices, is there a parallel uh, in terms of how you think about that over time? I think, you know, quite early on, uh, uh, in probably in IMA itself, I kind of uh, sort of doubled in on the fact that marketing was something I was good at and something that I enjoyed. And I've kind of broadly, uh, despite a lot of distractions here and there, you know, you know how things are, you can always get distracted. Uh, I like building consumer brands, I like doing advertising, I like sort of doing innovation. So I've kind of kept myself uh, focused on these areas. And I, with time I've also realized that, you know, I, I kind of enjoy it. And I've kind of stuck to that journey uh, rather than learning too many new tricks. But uh, if I may go back to that and persist, uh, what gave you that conviction? Uh, I remember back in 99 when a lot of us were running around like headless chickens saying, you know, we'll get into a bank or a consulting firm or something else that pays the big bucks. Yeah. You had extraordinary clarity that uh, this was it. Yeah. What, what gave you that conviction at that point? No, I think, you know, uh, 
I, I must say that my father, I was fortunate, who was, you know, he, 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 uh, you know, he was a generation into the corporate world. You know, he was an LNT. He had worked in banks, so he had a good sense of uh, the world. After you join, after ten years, twenty years. So I think he was one of the few things he was very clear about was that I joined Levers. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also felt that I should do marketing. He knew me well, so he was actually one of those guys who never really, you know, I was never a good student throughout because he never, he didn't allow me to do tuitions. He never really wanted me to do one thing. But the, one of the few things he wanted me to do in life uh, was to join Levers. I think he he had a high regard for the institution, but I think he also saw it. And I I, I must say that uh, when I as, at IMA, so I actually got into Levers before I joined IMA, and I didn't take it though my dad wanted me to join. Oh, Levers. is that so? I didn't yeah. Know so that. when I was in Xavier's, you know, they recruited management trainees. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And uh, he wanted me to take it, but I said no. I am, but he was still keen, you know. So he made I did my summers in Levers, and I also once I kind of uh, I guess so on the one axis there was a push there, and then I guess Professor A K Jain's marketing one did create a pull. So I I, I did get fascinated by. Him and the clarity of thought and sort of the deep rigor, because a lot of people, you know, come in thinking you know marketing is fluff, but you know, Ekjen was anything but that. It was just, just because it's not numbers all the time, it doesn't mean you can't have depth of thinking. So I guess those were the two influences that really have kept me going. In and if I may persist further, what gave your father uh, that conviction that HUL was the right thing for you? What about HUL appealed to him? See, he had a belief that uh, he was an old-fashioned guy. So he had a belief that the first job a person does, he was an engineer, he was an IIT engineer, should either be in the shop floor or in the market. So it was an old-fashioned view, and it's a hundred percent right view. These things don't go out of fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, and uh, I can say it as many times, I don't think young people should work in air-conditioned offices on Excel sheets for the first four or five years of their life. So he was very clear that. Uh, that foundation of uh, being out in the sort of heat, uh, uh, so it was a value system of his. Fascinating, fascinating. 